Yo, what's up guys? Welcome back to the Victo View channel. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the Blackmagic Pocket 4K and how it stacks up against the competition in 2020. <laughs> Manufacturers are starting to listen to the more low budget uh, indie filmmakers that have been craving for cameras at a relatively low cost with more camera specs or uh, more pro specs that you would see in a cinema camera. When it comes to low budget indie filmmaking, a lot of us rely on DSLRs, mirrorless cameras, but now that they're kind of introducing things like the Blackmagic Pocket 4K, uh, the 6K, it's really kind of opening you know, an avenue for filmmakers that don't want to spend a lot of money, but still need the good image quality that they crave. Some examples of the cameras that have kind of been pushing the boundaries as far as uh, pro specs is uh, the Zcam E2, the Pocket 6K, which would be the upgrade from the 4K, the Panasonic S1H, the Canon 1DX Mark III, which was really surprising considering all the things that they put in that camera. I didn't really expect them to put so many cinema grade specs. And then the last one would be the Canon EOS R5. There's still a lot that's unknown about this camera, but in the direction that it seems to be going with all of the release details about it, you know, it having IBIS, it having AK, it seems like Canon wants to put in more pro features. So we'll see exactly how many features uh, and how many things that they put in that camera that would fit a more cinema grade budget, but that is still unknown as of the making of this video. When the Pocket 4K was released or announced for that matter, it really shook up the world um, like they did with the first uh, Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera. However, because of this year and last year, there are a lot of cameras that are coming out that kind of match or are superior to it and I just started thinking about like where is it that this camera fits in especially in the filmmaking community right now my preferred camera choice as far as everything cinema is the blackmagic pocket 4k and it's actually what we're currently recording this video on right now so why is it that i chose the 4k over the 6k over the panasonic s1h over a lot of the cameras that have been coming out this past year the Micro Four Thirds mount flexibility is really useful, especially when you're considering the fact that you could use uh, Canon EF lenses, Nikon F, Micro Four Thirds native lenses like Olympus or uh, Panasonic for that matter. You also have the option to use vintage glass and really interesting vintage glass like uh, Pentax lenses. Uh, I believe there's also Leica Summicron lenses, Contax Zeiss, and the last but not least, Canon FD lenses. All because the Micro Four Thirds mount is essentially so flexible when it comes to putting on different lenses because it's kind of like your starting point and you can kind of just add on all of these different types of adapters to put you know, different lenses on that give you very interesting looks. To some filmmakers, anamorphic lenses are the bread and butter of filmmaking and with the pocket 4k because it has a micro four thirds sensor and a micro four thirds mount there are some really killer budget options as far as anamorphic lenses the ability to use speed boosters on this camera is such a killer feature for me if you so desire you can put on speed boosters that can give you an equivalent or really close to full frame or super 35 if you don't like the look of Micro Four Thirds. If you don't like the loss of depth of field, uh, if you don't like the low light performance, speed boosters come in really handy. Speed boosters like the Metabone series 0.71X and the 0.64XL are both extremely cool. Um, they are pretty pricey. However, if you are looking for something that's gonna be a little bit more on the budget friendly side, I would definitely suggest looking at Viltrox. I completely understand all the talk about Micro Four Thirds sensors and how there's a lot of filmmakers out there that don't like the look of them. And a lot of the reasons they don't like the look is because you get a loss of depth of field. 
you don't really get as good as low light performance as you would get on a full frame sensor or sometimes even a super 35. All of those things get erased when it comes to using a speed booster. So if that really is a make or break decision for you, you could use something like a Metabones XL speed booster and it would essentially take your micro four third sensor and make it the size of a full frame sensor as far as depth of field and the uh, field of view is concerned. The ability to use that is insane to me. Not only do you get this feature, but you also get an extra stop of light on whichever lens you're using. So if you have a lens that's f2.8, it's gonna now become a 1.8. If you have a lens that's f4, it's gonna be now like a three, which is roughly a 2.8. And accompanying that with the bigger sensor size, that's crazy to me. It's such a great feature and I don't understand how more people aren't blown away by that. One of the biggest pros for the Pocket 4K is the simple fact that it's $1,300 body only. Now this camera definitely does not qualify just to be body only. Let's just say that right now. Um, you'll definitely need to rig it out, build it out to some degree to fix some of the inconveniences of the camera like these expensive cfast cards you probably want to get an external ssd it will run you about anywhere from 80 to 150 bucks depending on which one you get you'll probably want to build a rig around it considering the fact that there is no ibis so you want to have some type of weight to counterbalance all of the shake in your hand and the last big thing for me is the battery life 100 you'll definitely need some type of external battery source just because this camera eats through LPE6 batteries. So all things considered, even though the camera is 1300 body only, you're definitely not gonna wanna just have it be body only. And if you do rig it out, it could be anywhere from, I would say $1,600 to about $2,500, depending on what you put on the camera as you see fit. But comparing the cost of this camera to some of the competitors out there, the Panasonic S1H body only is around $4,000. The Pocket 6K is $2,500 body only. The Canon 1DX Mark III is $5,500 body only. The Zcam E2 retails for about $2,000 body only. And that really is just body only. Uh, there's not even a monitor in that. So seeing the prices compared, all things considered, you could fully rig this camera out and I would say anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 if you really just wanna build it up to the max and you would still be in the ballpark of underneath a S1H and a little bit over just a pocket 6K body only. Let's talk about some of the pro features of the Blackmagic. Um, one of the biggest ones for me is the 12-bit color codec in Blackmagic RAW. That sounds so great to say. Your codec is really essential, especially if you're gonna be doing something like narrative filmmaking, because your codec really allows you to either have a lot of flexibility in color grading or to not have a lot of flexibility in color grading. And 12-bit with the ability of using RAW, fantastic. RAW essentially gives you the capability of changing things like your ISO, your white balance, after you've already shot the footage. So if you make any type of mistake on set or anything like that, you can basically make those mistakes without having to worry about it later just because you have that flexibility to change it in post. Typically cameras like your Reds, your Aries, they all shoot RAW, which is the exact same function, but with Blackmagic RAW, it's nowhere near the size as far as files and it runs really smooth. However, the file sizes are nowhere near uh, Red Raw and Airy Raw. And if you're using DaVinci Resolve, Blackmagic Raw runs extremely smooth if you have a computer with a decent GPU. The low light capability of the Pocket 4K is also extremely good, uh, considering the fact that it is a micro four third sensor, which isn't typically known for being good in low light, but this one stands up pretty well. Considering the fact that this camera is a micro four third sensor, it isn't typically known for having good low light. And by known, I mean the micro four third sensor. It has a dual native ISO. The first ISO starts at 400 and the second ISO starts at 1250. If you shoot at 400, 
you can shoot anywhere from 400 to 800 for 1250 that's where i would really use it for indoors or you know like events or anything like that but at 1250 it resets the noise basically so when you're at iso 1000 versus 1250 1250 looks extremely clean and 1000 looks really grainy having the ability to change the iso on the go if you're doing any type of run and gun stuff or if you just can't really worry about external lighting at the time is extremely useful this camera also has 13 stops of dynamic range and to be honest for the price that this camera is i'll take it 13 isn't the best uh, when it comes to dynamic range but for me it's definitely more than enough it would be nice uh, in the future the black magic that they'll put you know 14 stops or even 15 stops in their more compact smaller cameras if you're using anamorphic lenses or if you're a fan of using anamorphic lenses this camera does have 2.8k anamorphic d squeeze which i think is awesome uh, they didn't have that feature before october of 2019 uh, but now they do along with the ability to shoot 2.6k at 120 frames per second most cameras in this price range really only shoot 120p or 120 frames per second at 1080p so i'll take it all day the last pro for me would be the black magic design menus they did such a great job on laying it out it's really simple uh, it's really straightforward to get lost in it is very uncommon for me especially transitioning from using dslrs where you have to go into the menu and you really have to dig into menus and then sub menus you don't really have to deal with that in the uh, pocket 4k it's pretty straightforward everything you need is right there it's straight at your face you don't really have to go and search for it as much as you would on a uh, dslr and in these menus you do get some of the best features that you can in a cinema camera like false colors some of the best focus peaking i've seen in a camera blackmagic design also included the fact that you can use your own imported luts or others if you so desire along with the fact that you can use your own or others imported luts straight into the camera is fantastic you get to view essentially what is going to be your final image or at least close to it before you even get to the studio one of the last things that you get with a pocket 4k is not only the camera not only all of the features all the flexibility that you can get with it but the simple fact that when you purchase it new you get a copy of davinci resolve studio which retails for 300 dollars and you get it for free 99. i used to be a premiere pro editor but ever since i touched davinci after owning this camera I haven't really had much urge to go back at all, actually, especially because DaVinci is such a great color grading software. Uh, the music effects and all of the audio editing that you can do is phenomenal. The standard editing, uh, which would be compared to Premiere Pro, has yet to give me any hiccups and has sped up my workflow. And the last thing about DaVinci that I think is a really big pro is that if you have a good computer with a decent GPU, I've put 4K DCI, Blackmagic Raw with, you know, film grain, LUTs, no LUTs, effects. I could throw on a ton on my computer. And if I put too much, like sometimes it'll hiccup, but like the things that I can put on the timeline or add in the project is crazy, especially considering that the timeline performance stays relatively the same. Um, it doesn't really slow down my workflow. It plays really smooth. The playback is fantastic. To do what I do in DaVinci and do that in Premiere, my computer would definitely not be able to handle it. Now, there are some cons uh, to this camera, like I said before, when it comes to building it out. I think the pros far outweigh the cons. However, um, some things, like I said before, that you'll wanna do is you'll definitely wanna have some type of external battery source. You'll want to get some type of external media. So SSDs, Samsung SSDs are fantastic, like the T5. And you'll also want to add a lot of weight, or at least as much as you can, just because there is no IBIS and the camera is relatively small and light. So you can fall into that trap of having that jittery, nasty, shaky footage. It's not that natural sway, that handheld look. It's going to be more... DSLR mirrorless camera shake. 
the rear LCD is full touchscreen, but it does not flip out or anything like that. So this definitely isn't like a vlogger's camera. You want to use this for more professional settings, something where you're behind the camera typically and not in front of it despite the fact that's exactly what I'm doing right now. So it is possible, uh, but it isn't the most convenient thing. Anyways, at the end of the day, use what you can, use what you have. Filmmaking is about the story. Yes, cameras are super amazing and they're getting way better as time goes on, but it's all about the story at the end of the day. You're likely not to have the impact on people that you want, if your story is lackluster, no matter what camera you use. So go out there and shoot, rinse, repeat. I'll talk to you guys later. Peace.